I have found, and you will too, the real hijackers. I found the real hijackers, some of which are still alive. I'm sure they didn't want to be found, and I'm pretty darn sure that the United States government didn't want them to be found. The captain on Flight 77, 757, that supposedly hit the Pentagon, worked in the Pentagon for 17 years. One of the things he did when he worked in the Pentagon was he created war games. One of the war games that he created, and you may see that people are denying this, but it's the truth. He wrote a war game of a scenario of a 757 aircraft commercial striking the Pentagon. And guess who supposedly was at the helm of Flight 77? That same guy. The truth that we have uncovered about 9-11 is much more horrific than their conspiracy that an aluminum aircraft can fly through a steel and concrete building, can go through a steel and Kevlar reinforced brick multiple layered buildings such as the Pentagon and completely disappear. The whole event of 9-11 is so different than what most people were told and shown and still are to this day. I talked to a New York firefighter that has spent about a month on the piles looking for any, anyone in dead bodies and stuff. And when I asked him about the firefighters and he told me that their bodies had been disintegrated, they found some bunker gear and some breathing apparatus. And I realized when I heard him say that, that what was used had so much heat and so much pressure to disintegrate a human body. There was nothing left of these guys. Where are they? Where are they? That's what the Americans should be asking. Where are the law enforcement people? Where are our congressmen and senators? 9-11 wasn't hatched and planned by George W. Bush at all. It was planned long in advance of him getting into the White House. This was a deep state operation, 9-11. The Patriot Act was already written. And basically, the Patriot Act kind of put us in a totally different extra constitutional government outside the boundaries of the Constitution. I now see things that happened, and I see the same recipe and some of the same players all the way back to the Kennedy and the Iran-Contra. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. There's an agenda that is still ongoing. The coup is still ripe in this country. We may or may not make it through as the red, white, and blue America that you grew up with. If you are over 20, we may be losing it. We may lose our country. It's so infiltrated by the deep state that it's just fascinating. At the same time, it's very scary. I have just actually been joined by more of military, ex-military, military intelligence, people that have spent long careers on sort of secret Air Force base type places. You know, people ask me, how do you know people are telling you the truth? Well, you, I won't put something in the book unless it's been reconfirmed. So the whole thing has come together with so many people bringing this information and looking at everything and then going through and listening to the tapes between the pilots and the air traffic controllers and the fact that only air traffic controllers could have done this because it made no sense to me at all. And if there's a radar system out that's going to affect your takeoffs, your landings, your approaches, or a longer range radar that affects your aircraft coming in to wherever you're at, there's uh, codes for that. I would not have seen that. I had a lot of information. And once those air traffic controller eyes looked at it, that's how we found out that for the getaway plane to get away without being seen, two things happened. 
A lot of the radar was shut down. Now, that could have been shut down by the speckled trout with uh, General Hugh Shelton in it because he was right in that neighborhood and uh, put it out of service. The speckled trout, that was a 707 that had been actually put together at Edwards Air Force Base. Imagine that. The speckled trout was right where Flight 11 lost communication in Western Massachusetts at the same time I have their flight plan from Andrews Air Force Base. Exactly where Flight 11 fell off their radar and lost communication with air traffic control, the speckled trout was there. So they could have done all of the remote takeover if that's what they did and landed that airplane from using the speckled trout. Or they could have wiped it off the radar. They could have just made it disappear to the air traffic controllers. They could have just made the blip go away, just like we know P-TECH and MITRE could have done as well. So, and here's an interesting thing. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Hugh Shelton, who was on that plane, in his book, lied about where they were. I have their flight plan. I can tell you exactly where they were when all of this started. They were still in the United States. He claimed they were halfway to Europe, but that's not true because I know what time they left Andrews and I know how far they could get and I know all their waypoints. So he's a liar. Why would he lie? Probably because the speckled trout was a part of this. Because he claimed that they were over the center of the Atlantic circling all day. But then later on, he says, he flew over New York City coming home around noonish, right after the second tower had fallen. Well, let's say noon. But he didn't land, because I have his flight plan and his landing. He didn't land at Andrews until 440 in the afternoon. So the guy's a liar. Why would he be lying? Well, here's another thing that the speckled trout could do. They could have helped, and they did, the getaway plane not show up on radar and uh, navigate its way across the Atlantic. Ask yourself, why did General Shelton lie about everything? Somebody that knew the phone numbers to the air traffic control towers and centers phoned in bomb threats. They phoned in fires. They phoned in all kinds of airplane coming crashing at you. These are not phone numbers that are open to the public. They weren't then, they still aren't. But somebody was calling all of this, and it was Erie, it was Niagara Falls, it was Pittsburgh and Chicago, and they evacuated their stations. So nobody was there to look to see the getaway plane on any radar, on primary or anything. And so looking at all of this, we can see when the radar went out of system, for instance, at Cape Cod, and it's a long distance radar out over the Atlantic. So it would have picked up all of Massachusetts. It was out of service the night before. I wonder why. So you see, there was all these things that were put into place. The question is, who made those phone calls to all of those very private numbers? It has to be an insider to do that. And the fact that we've even uncovered a getaway plane, and how did they get away? Well, because there was a speckled trout that was able to knock out all of the northeast sector of radar that wasn't already knocked out that night before. And why, how do we know this? Because it's in the daily logs in the FOIA data from the air traffic control centers. And so when air traffic control specialists joined me, let's just say that the long distance radar out of Cape Cod is out, which it was that day. Well, then if you're, you know, flying past it, they're not going to pick you up on radar. So we found a 757 getaway plane. And how did we find that plane? Because one of the air traffic controllers that actually dealt with it when it was leaving Mojave Boneyard and flying VFR, which commercial planes can't do legally, visual flight rules, leaving Mojave Boneyard and flying through a restricted space just south of Edwards Air Force Base and was in a near miss with a Continental 737. How do we know this? Because the air traffic controllers that were involved in that contacted me. Now, they also started watching that 757, and it looked like a U.S. Air aircraft. But they also knew that that particular 757 
had a fuel bladder put into it so that it could fly pretty much anywhere in the world if it wanted to. Exactly. With an additional fuel bladder added to that aircraft, it gave it mileage big time. It could have gone all the way to Tel Aviv, no doubt. How do we know that? Because we've talked to the person that that helped put the fuel bladder in that aircraft. But that same air traffic controller also told me about a large Russian cargo plane for several months prior to 9-11 was coming in to land at Mojave. It was unloading gold into an old ammo bunker. One of these air traffic controllers went with a camera and he opened this thing up and all the lights inside the airplane was just pallets of gold. And so they, it was stored there. And then the um, CIA put up anti-personnel devices, cameras, and all the like all around these bunkers. So people want to know, how come those vaults underneath the Twin Towers were empty of their gold? Well, that had been going on for quite some time. I actually had family members of crew members talk long conversations with me about crew members, both flight attendants and cockpit crew, where they were offered a job or had been working off and on with the Central Intelligence Agency. They happened to have also been involved on the four planes around 9-11s. So that meant either the captain was in on this or the co-pilot was in on it because you have to steer that aircraft on the ground from the captain's seat. Your research, your deep dives into these people have indicated that in fact they were employed by the CIA and that their families were employed by the CIA, their fathers, their mothers, and the history of some of these people is absolutely incredible. It's the only thing that really made sense after talking to friends and family that knew that these people had made deals with the CIA and they knew that there was something wrong, even how they got called up to take the trip when they were supposed to have the day off. Well, one of the things you you said was, is that as your research continued to evolve and and develop over the years, that, you know, you maybe have moved a little bit away from that flight termination system being used. But, you know, it's possible that even if you had people on board the plane that were involved in hijacking, that they could have used the flight termination system in conjunction with them for two reasons. One, to guarantee that they were going to go through with what it was they'd promised to do. And two, to keep the communications at a minimum or a non-existent. So, I mean, that's possible. Yeah. Uh, I thought the planes had landed there remotely at first, but now I know better. First, I thought that's what they did because I couldn't believe anything else. So let me get this straight. So what you're saying is, is the first officer in the right seat can't control the airplane on the ground. It has to be done by the captain. Yep, from the captain's seat. So even though they take turns landing airplanes and whatnot, the captain always is the guy that's steering it into the hangar. That's right. But at first, I originally thought that they'd been remotely taken over. But as I kept going and researching and then getting all of the Freedom of Information Act data, then I started to see a whole different window opened up, a whole different dimension opened up, really. The whole thing just changed. Had I not spoken with an adult child of one of the crew members about his father admitting to him that he'd been offered a job with the CIA and if he accepted it, it meant that he could never see his children again. Well, that father happened to be a black belt in multiple martial arts. As a flight attendant, he could have and would have taken the hijackers out, but there were no hijackers on the plane. So a lot of uh, people were questioning, well, how could they have done this with the crew? How did they get involved? When were they called up for this? 20 of the 25 flight attendants were last minute. That's unheard of. This is all four aircraft. All of the pilots were last minute or late schedule changes somewhere around the 10th of September. It seems like the decision to go on this whole event was made the afternoon of September 10th. Some people were removed from their trips. Airline people know darn good and well 
that a senior captain, like what we are dealing with on all four of the 9-11 planes, a senior captain who bids to have their days off and to bids to fly certain trips, they don't get a phone call from the company that says, oh, you got to fly in your day off and there's nothing you can do about it. Because when you have seniority, there's always somebody below you that can do it. And that's what would have happened. Even though uh, you retire from the airline, you're still in the airline family. And so it's kind of a family unit and it's, it, it truly is very difficult. This is the pill that you can't swallow if you're in, in the industry that somebody would do this that's actually a, a crew member, pilot or flight attendant. I have found inf information that connects nearly every last minute crew member to the military, to the CIA, and to the FBI. One of the pilots I found, he was civil air patrol. That's really not military, but it is the CIA's Air Force. So both of his parents were career central intelligence agency workers. One of the things that was also really weird is I uncovered, and this was one of the United pilots, I believe. The pilots were leaving on a two-day trip. They were going to the West Coast and coming back. And this was obviously September 11th and 12th. And um, he made a phone call from the cockpit. Now, pilots come into the cockpit. They don't pretty much have much time for they don't usually have time, it's very uncommon, that they would phone home because they just left home. And they knew they were leaving home, right, the next, the day before. But one of the pilots called his wife and gave her lengthy instructions on how to winterize their outdoor swimming pool, which is a very odd thing to do for numerous reasons. They get into the cockpit with just enough time to do their safety check. They really don't have much time for, you know, fiddle farting around up there. They don't usually do stuff like that. As a matter of fact, his wife even said how unusual it was, but she thought it was so odd. And isn't it just like he knew he was never coming home? None of the flight attendants did what we were trained. And it never made sense to me until... I had a very long conversation with a family member of one of the flight attendants who indeed had made a deal with the Central Intelligence Agency to be a part of this. Now, I don't know what the Central Intelligence explained to them. I don't know if they were told they were on a drill, if they were, you know, I have no idea. But one of the flight attendants for United had told her a military father that she was in a special terrorist training at United for the weeks leading up to 9-11. And there was no terrorist training. Uh, there was just your yearly recertification thing. We didn't use the terminology terrorism or terrorist. It was always a hijacker, always. Now, somebody asked me a question about, well, you know, if I talked about the crew members that did this, if they're still alive, they could be killed. Ask me if I care. Because they didn't care that 250 or so passengers were killed. And there were a lot of people that just happened to be getting on those planes going from A to B. Grandmothers, children. The one thing there wasn't were pass riding flight attendants. They were all denied passage, said the planes were weight restricted, and you don't restrict, weight restrict an airplane that isn't completely full. But they didn't want any real flight attendants that didn't weren't a part of the game. That's why they were denied boarding. And it happened a lot, and a lot of them have contacted me. Some of them even have the real passenger manifest still. The people that worked at the airlines when they found out that it was a United plane or an American plane, well, at that time, we had these dot matrix printers for our, what they call passenger manifests. They went right to a computer, hit three or four buttons, and printed those out. And as much as the FBI tried to deny them leaving the airport, they did. So there are no Arab names on the real passenger manifests. If there weren't any Arab hijackers on board, who was doing this? How did this happen? If the crew members were involved in a faked hijacking, then why didn't they follow protocol? Well, here's why. The protocols were set up and they were very effective to end 
successfully a hijack attempt, which is getting the plane on the ground and getting all the passengers safely off the and crew safely off the plane. But if you were the CIA and you wanted to completely fake the hijacking, because you've already landed the plane at Westover, for example, for Betty Ong, she said was, well, I don't know, but we might be being hijacked. Well, I'm like, wait a minute. Why are you sitting in your jump seat not doing your flight attendant duties? And then you say you don't know if you're being hijacked or not? Well, that's because the plane was on the ground. She also said, we're the first. Somebody told her there would be more than one. Somebody told her that long before she got on that airplane, she was also a last minute addition to the crew. How would she know they were the first? This was at 18 minutes or 20 minutes after eight that morning. Somebody had to tell her there were a number of airplanes that were going to be hijacked. The success for the CIA and for the faked hijacking to get the planes landed and to allow enough time for them to get on that 757 to fly out of the country, which is what they did. They didn't follow protocol, nor did the air traffic controllers. They waited for almost a half an hour after they lost contact about 20 minutes before they even started to think about calling the military in. This should have happened instantaneously, within six minutes or less, because Otis Air Force Base was scrambled, and it's right there. And that airplane would have had two F-15s on its wingtips, and they would have landed the plane. But that's not what they wanted. Success for the CIA was a complete Operation Northwoods version 2.0. A faked hijacking to start the wars. None of them that didn't do their job Correctly, none of them lost their job, but almost every one of them got promoted. If you really in real life failed to do your job that badly, then you would expect to lose your job or be reprimanded, right? But most of those people got a promotion. And that always kind of bothered me. And it always made me think, well, so some of these people did know. They did know what was going on. But, you know, when you're threatened with the life of your children or your parents or, you know, your everything, I mean, this the government has the power to kill your pets, kill your kids, whatever, and silence you. We've got a thousand letters from flight attendants from every single airline across the United States that said, you know, I always found it really weird that after 9-11, we were never told the details that really mattered. And not one airline after 9-11 to this day would actually talk about or discuss any of the details of 9-11. When we started to dig into each and every crew member and each and every passenger, craziest stuff came up. I found the real hijackers some of which are still alive. I'm sure they didn't want to be found, and I'm pretty darn sure that the United States government didn't want them to be found. The captain on Flight 77, 757, that supposedly hit the Pentagon, worked in the Pentagon for 17 years. One of the things he did when he worked in the Pentagon was he created war games. One of the war games that he created... And you may see that people are denying this, but it's the truth. He wrote a war game of a scenario of a 757 aircraft commercial striking the Pentagon. And guess who supposedly was at the helm of Flight 77? Yeah, that same guy. What do you think the chances of that are? Data from Andrews Air Force Base. It's very, very telling because people always want to know what happened to the bodies. The people that were the passengers and the crew members that were not involved because not all of them were. And not all of the passengers obviously were involved. And I was actually working with a guy who had spent many years as an air traffic controller on a military base and knew exactly what we were looking at. 
and we found three DC-9 medevac aircraft. Those are only used for the military to transport uh, wounded soldiers or dead bodies. And they came in, yes, from the area that we knew uh, the four planes had been landed in. It's around 9 o'clock on the night of 9-11. Now, if you'll remember, there really were no bodies to be flown out of anywhere. The bodies at the inside the Pentagon were taken out from the ground. There was no need to put them on an airplane to fly them to Andrews Air Force Base. They would have transported them separately, not, not in an aircraft. So we know that uh, just coincidentally that those three medevac planes would hold just the people that were not involved. What happened then? Well, there's crematoriums there that are you know, incinerators that, that could have been taken care of, the bodies. I'm waiting for a medevac crew member to contact me. Again, there were no Arabs on the real passenger manifests. They are only there because the FBI created fake passenger manifests. So the collection of people that came forward, those are the really the true heroes of our country as far as I'm concerned. Now there are four eyewitnesses for the planes landing that morning. And some of them knew exactly what time it was because they just dropped their kids off at school or they had just started, they were just about to go to work. My last eyewitness for the aircraft coming in for the landing at Westover in Western Massachusetts was a one-time federal employee with the FBI. And she saw United 175 and how low to the ground it was and how scared she was that for the people on board that she was sure that they were going to crash. And this was before anything hit in New York. This was around 8.30, so it was about 15 minutes before anything hit in New York, before any of us knew there was any hijackings going on. This is her statement. This is a notarized affidavit that's legal in a court of law, and she's willing to go to court to share this word. I was living in Otis, Massachusetts on September 11, 2001. At approximately 8.30 to 8.35, I saw a United Airlines fly over my residence at the time, and I was shocked because the plane was so low. I could see the people in the windows, and I was standing on a deck on the second floor, and I was watching the plane fly over the top of the house, and I lost track of it because of the way the building was, but I do think it was going north when it flew over the house, and after I lost sight of it, I was speaking with my neighbor, and we were just amazed at the height of the plane. It was so low. I shouldn't say height, meaning altitude. It was just so low. We were flabbergasted. Now I know that it was approximately 8.30 and I would say 8.45 at the very latest because I had to go to an appointment in the next town over and be there by 9.30 and I left maybe five minutes after the plane and headed over to Great Barrington, the next town over. So there is a signed affidavit of a person who was an eyewitness to what really happened on 9-11. There was a fighter jet that eventually scrambled around 924 over New York City. Now, the plane they were scrambled for, Flight 11, had supposedly crashed into the tower at 846. So almost 45 minutes later, he actually sees on his radar screen on board his jet, Flight 11 heading southbound to Washington, D.C. you got to ask yourself, how did that happen? Because, wait a minute, that plane had crashed into the North Tower. Airplanes don't just disappear, even though they tried to convince you that with MH370. The engines ping, and um, Flight 93 was actually pinging from Springfield, Massachusetts. So how did it get there? When a plane crashes, it doesn't ping anymore. But these planes did. And people that work dispatch and operations and the airlines involved, they know this. They knew it. They knew it on day one. They know that those planes hadn't crashed where they were told. There's one thing that's interesting to me in the FOIA data. Whenever you save something onto a computer, it's time and date stamped. When they uploaded them into the FAA headquarters computer in Washington, D.C., they were time stamped and date stamped three or more hours 
prior to Flight 11, the first plane to push back out of Boston, ever pushing back, somewhere between 5 and 6 in the morning. Well, Flight 93 was already parked at the ground, almost 10 minutes or more, before the phone call started. That's how Tom Burnett made a mistake. And those mistakes in the timeline are where they always make mistakes. And a voice file was marked terrorist. Just And that caught my attention because in aviation at the time, we didn't have any training or ever discuss terrorism. It was unheard of. Our issue was hijacking. The terrorist voice, we have some planes, we're going back to the airport in an Israeli accent was uploaded an hour and a half before Flight 11 left the gate. Uh, you got to ask yourself this. How did the FAA headquarters know that the hijacker would really be a terrorist at 6.37 a.m. on September 11th, 2001? Well, when I got to that point, I was like, oh boy. When the planes were making phone calls, they all were on the ground at Westover. They all were. Think about if you've ever uh, been on your cell phone or ha been talking to someone that was on their cell phone while they were driving in their car and they opened the window. Or you can just hear the engine of their car sometimes. I mean, that's magnified major in a jet. So when I started to see all these things that were not right with the picture, I'm like, wait a minute. If the people on the receiving end of the f phone calls from Flight 93 said they couldn't hear any jets, they didn't hear any commotion, no jet sounds. There, was, It was, this one woman even said, it was so quiet. It was as if they were in the room next to me. And I went, bingo. They were on the ground. Flight attendant from Flight 93, Cece Lyles. She was a police officer for six years before she started to be a flight attendant. She'd been flying for about a year. She called her husband and she left a very, very sad goodbye message to her husband on their home recorder. Again, this is something a flight attendant would do under duress. She did not hang up the phone. She handed the receiver to someone, it sounds like a woman, and according to most voice specialists that have heard this, the woman's voice says to her, you did great. And no one would be telling a flight attendant that. Now keep in mind, at the time, according to the government documents, that airplane she was on and the woman sitting next to her saying you did great was coming out of the sky six to 10,000 feet per minute at a 40 plus degree angle and quite possibly upside down, according to the National Transportation Safety Board. And that was one of their first mistakes, claiming that all of these people called using cell phones. Here's something else to keep in mind. If the hijackers, as official government story went, were on all four of those planes, and they took those planes, both two of them into the uh, Twin Towers, one into the Pentagon and one into Shanksville, those hijackers would have never allowed anybody to make phone calls. And they'd have just done what they did because that was the most important thing for them, so to speak. And you, we wouldn't have known a thing about 9-11 other than the fact that these planes crashed. Because without the phone calls and lots of phone calls, particularly from F Flight 93, which were, you know, all heart wrenching and emotion, you know, grabbing. emotion grabbing kinds of things, we wouldn't have known. And they needed to have it known. They needed to have the world know what it was that they were trying to pull off. Well, one of the other things you were telling me the other day that you found is that the reservation agent that she called kept putting words in her mouth. If, you, if she was in a court of law, you would say, objection, your honor, leading the witness. And I think I've always known that, that she was doing that, but I didn't know why. And you found out why. If you've made it this far, you need to know this. For the reservation agent at American Airlines that Betty Ong was talking to had about a year or so, give or take a month or two, seniority as a reservation agent with American Airlines. And before that, she lived in Japan for 12 years and was an employee of the Department of Defense. Uh-oh. 
What does that tell you? Now we know why she was putting words in Betty Ong's mouth. Betty Ong never said there were three, four, or five hijackers or terrorists on the plane. She never said that. But this agent that she's talking to keeps filling in. I had an American Airlines flight attendant contact me questioning how did this agent know to say this because Betty never told her this. What are the chances that Betty Ong would call out to a reservations office? First off, no flight attendant would do that. Second off, that she would connect with a DOD employee, the Department of Defense, for those of you who aren't into the acronyms, which is the Pentagon. Another interesting thing I found is that Rockwell Collins, or Rockwell, had just updated the phone lines at American Airlines. So when Betty Ong called in on a reservations line and she said that she was on a plane that was hijacked, she thought, she wasn't sure. She said, I don't know, we might be being hijacked, but somebody been stabbed. And she's So the reservation system has a big red button that's an emergency button that should have recorded every single word said until she hung up or the call was disconnected. That phone system had just recently been updated by Rockwell and it was updated to the point where only four minutes of her phone call was recorded. Remember that Barbara Olson, she called her husband who was the Solicitor General at the Department of Justice at the time. She called in from Flight 77 and according to the official government documents and they were at an altitude much higher than 1800 feet. First he said, and he lied, I have to say, he just lied. He said she tried to call collect from her cell phone. She called two times, three times, four times, and that story changes all the time. And then he said that she called from an air phone, you know, the kind that the, the airplane had. And as of January 31st, 2001, American Airlines 757, which she supposedly was on, didn't have an activated air phone. So she had to have called from a cell, somebody's cell. She couldn't call collect from a cell. That's impossible. So th not only does it look like he's a liar, but he's saying that she called from a cell phone. So I knew that's not true. It's just not possible. I did look into Barbara Olson. After the methodical illusion came out, I kept looking into all of these people and the things that I found. And so the word coincidence, I don't use it anymore. And I'll tell you why. Barbara Olson, and she uh, grew up in Texas. After a couple years of college, she went to Hollywood and she went to work for Stacy Keach Productions at HBO. Now, if you know anything about Hollywood, HBO, I might as well say CIA. And she worked there for a decade and it's impossible to find what she did. She could have been acting, she could have been taking acting lessons, she could have been doing commercials, we don't know what she was doing. She went to Yeshiva Law School, I believe it's in New York, it's a Jewish school, graduated from there and went right into the top of the pick pile in Washington, D.C. She joined a law firm called Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. Another interesting partner in the law firm that Barbara Olson worked at was Jamie Gorlick. She was a member of the 9-11 Commission. But lo and behold, if the former FBI director, Robert Mueller, who was the director, and he also was one of the lawyers in Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering alongside of Barbara Olson. I'm seeing things that are way beyond coincidence, but then I look to see who some of their clients are at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pickering. Now, remember the guy I was telling you about, 9B, the guy who was the trained assassin? Well, he had a company called Akamai Technologies, and it's a communications company, internet, and phone, and stuff. And lo and behold, if the client list doesn't start out in alphabetical order with Akamai Technologies, the company that was owned by the passenger sitting on Flight 11 in 9B, the highly trained assassin, and the Sayret Metcalf Special Operations Agent from the Israeli Defense Forces, Daniel Lewin. His company is Akamai Technologies. The second company that's the client of Barbara Olson's law firm that she went to work for is another Israeli company called Amdocs. 
And if you don't have to look very deep to learn this, Amdocs is an Israeli company. We're also monitoring every single phone call for a decade before 9-11. But they missed all the 19 hijackers calling each other. Another, a couple interesting companies that that are clients for the same Barbara Olson law firm. They did some investigative committees for the board of directors for Enron and for WorldCom. Remember, they were both in Building 7. Barbara Olson, she came out of law school. She married her husband, Ted Olson. Ted Olson was the attorney for the Israeli Mossad spy, Jonathan Pollard. So do we need any more connections to Barbara Olson and the Mossad? She's also Jewish. She couldn't be more connected to Israel, the Mossad, and the Hollywood CIA connection. She may not have been on the plane, actually. There's a chance that she could have just not even gotten on the plane. So there's no picture proof that she was even on the aircraft. There is no security cameras that show any of the accused hijackers getting on any of those four aircraft. How do you explain that? But there's a reason for that, because there weren't any Arabs on board. And one of the things that I was really shocked to find out uh, was from a lot of American flight attendants that contacted me. They were told that the ringleader of this 9-11 terror attack was a guy named Mohammed Atta. And they all knew him because Mohammed Atta was a million mile customer for American Airlines. But not all of them knew him as the picture they showed us. So how many Mohammed Attas were flying around? Maybe several with fake ID. Well, we know that Mohammed Atta was still alive after September 12th because he talked to both his mother and father. I have read that he was killed in 2005 or six if he was taken out because people started to wake up around that time. But his parents had both spoken with him after 9-11. Clearly, Israel was a big part of this. And there were many people that happened to be either Jewish Americans or Israelis, Israeli Jews, that were staying in the towers with the art group that were living in the towers that were part of the shoddy elevator company that up and left. You'll remember the five dancing Israelis that were arrested in New Jersey. They went back to Israel and they were all Mossad agents, all five of them. And they went on Israeli television and they said this. They said they were sent to document the event, which means they were sent from Israel to go to New York to document what someone in Israel knew was going to happen. I discovered is through the Promise software and through all of the Israeli companies that the United States government has hired and the software that has a back door installed in it, Israel is in control of our entire national security. And if they want that scenario to happen and they want to blame it on Iran, that false flag will happen. And I often refer to it as a nuclear 9-11. And I think that that's what they will do because people around the world are waking up to their involvement in 9-11. That's my take. We're very, very vulnerable as a nation because people just don't know. We have trusted our best friend in the Middle East for so many years. Unless we can talk about it and shut it from the rooftops and wake everyone up to see who was really behind 9-11 and when we can stop them from doing their next planned false flag. And it is planned. I read it in print. So another thing I've seen covered up, and Tom Burnett, who called his wife, happened to be a flight attendant for Delta, he somehow knew one minute before the official hijacking took place that the plane was hijacked. But he also said there was a gun on board and a bomb. And so you have all of these weapons. You have box cutters, knives, bombs, guns, mace, and or pepper spray all of those things were not allowed to go through security. And I know that the uh, people who ran security, Huntley USA, is a subsidiary of an Israeli company whose CEO, owner, founder, was sitting in prison. 
ICTS Corporation, and that they chose in the year or two prior to 9-11 to fill most of the um, security people run not by the government. The passenger manifest, and people have asked me about it, every passenger manifest I've ever seen on the internet is fake. Let me just tell you what a real passenger manifest looked like in 2001, so you can see why I'm saying they're fake. It was on a long roll, and it was dot matrix print, if you'll remember back when we had a lot of that going on from computers. And the passenger information was put on there. There were several different types of, are referred to as manifests. And these are basically lists of passengers that have reservations on the plane. The reservations computer system will spit out a list of passengers and each passenger has a PIN, a passenger identification number, passenger locator number, PLN. Each person is listed there with this number and that number associates to your credit card, your personal information. And that's how do you think when there's a crash or an incident like they wanted us to believe 9-11 was, how do you think that your next of kin gets notified. They don't go through the process of looking up your credit card. So all of that information is connected to you when you make a reservation and you go into the airline computer. Prior to the airplane taking off, that original passenger load information with all the people listed, there's a rendition of that gets handed after all of the passengers check in at the gate and get on board the aircraft, there is another form of that manifest that is for the flight crew that's on board. Well, I look at that spill and their pertinent information. If they're Jewish and they need a kosher meal, it'll be on that list. If you don't speak English, guess what? It'll be written on the manifest. Now on 9-11, there's some interesting things that happened after that is that the FBI claimed that they had the passenger manifests and that on those passenger manifests, there were four people that are no longer on the list of accused hijackers that the FBI claimed were there. Now you need to understand this. They claimed that they got the passenger manifests from the airline companies. American and United. And they claimed that there were four people that were hijackers that were on those manifests. But the problem is three of those people showed up alive. One of them was a flight instructor in Florida who was an FAA qualified employee and flight instructor. He just happened to have a Middle Eastern name. His cousin, I believe it was, with the same last name, who was dead for a year, died in a small airplane crash out of Florida. And then two other brothers or relatives, I think they were brothers also, also showed up alive. Now, what kind of manifest do you think the FBI was looking at to see those four people as hijackers on that, quote, manifest? They were obviously not dealing with the real passenger manifest, now were they? On an average, there was 170 available seats on each of those four airplanes on 9-11. There were plenty of people that tried to get on those flights that were denied boarding, that most of them were flight attendants that I'm hearing from, that were told that in the computer, the flight showed as full. So that's why all 170 seats are full. When you have a plane like that, that's that full booked, by the time everybody gets to the airport and gets on and gets through the traffic and stuff, you might have two, maybe four, maybe as much as six no-shows. We call them no-shows. These are people who had reservations and didn't show up. Now, interestingly enough, Flight 11 was booked full and people were denied boarding, but it only had like 86 passengers or so. So they had almost 100 empty seats. And that's part of the story that's being uncovered. How is it that the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who claimed they got in their hot little hands in the hours after 9-11 happened, the passenger manifest 
and four people that were not part of the hijacking group were listed. And so they were lying, weren't they? Because one guy was dead for a year and three guys showed up all still alive. Now, can you imagine the panic you would be in if you were a Middle Eastern person living in the United States, maybe for 20, 15, 20 years, and he, he goes to the TV and he's listed in the newspaper the next morning as a hijacker that was piloting one of the flights. You have to ask yourself, well, then if they were wrong with their first list, where'd they get those four names? Because they showed that to us for the first 72 hours of after 9-11. So it's really interesting, isn't it, that they were lying to us. So if they were lying to us for the first 72 hours, do you think it's possible that the FBI could be lying to us about every quote-unquote Arab hijacker? And of course they were. So why were they? What were they covering up? And that's where it gets real deep. And so this passenger manifest, it's in a computer, and it doesn't change. So what am I looking at as an insider in the airline? I'm looking at it a sheer, utter impossibility that the FBI claimed they got passenger manifests with 19 Arabs listed on them that were not on those planes. I'm thinking if you were a flight attendant and you were not in on this charade, the faked hijacking, you would be mind blown to find a hundred empty seats on a booked flight that was booked full. But now we know why all of the flights were booked full. And even though the passengers did not show up for those flights, the flight attendants who were flying, trying to fly on a non-rev ticket to go to Los Angeles were denied boarding because of weight restriction. Weight restriction happens very rarely on a jumbo jet. And it would only happen if all the passengers showed up and filled every seat and there was massive amount of fuel and cargo on board. And I think I've been contacted from a flight attendant that tried to fly that day on one of those four flights on all of the flights. Normally, the chain of command is that the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, and then the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, get the data from a crash or incident or anything that happens. It doesn't go to the FBI immediately ever except on 9-11. And the FBI ran immediately to not just the people that accepted phone calls to grab their caller ID that said Tom's cell, but they went immediately to all the air traffic control centers and towers and pulled the tapes. Some of them got destroyed. Now you have to ask yourself why, when the normal procedure is them to get it third or fourth hand down the line, why did all protocol get broken that day? Well, because they were covering it up. And this includes Robert Mueller, especially. Robert Mueller is the guy who ordered all the 85 plus security cameras that show clearly a missile hitting the Pentagon. And you can't see them. But it wasn't just that. It was also the fact that he ordered the confiscation of all of the phone recorders and all of the um, voice recorders that people had in their homes that indicated that they'd been called by by their spouse or whomever uh, on a cell phone. Yeah. You know, he ordered the confiscation of that. And do we know where those things are? No. No. Everything is sealed. and It's probably all been destroyed now. Every single solitary part is goes into the parts book that Boeing refuses to make public on those four Boeing aircraft. Every coffee maker, every coffee warmer, every galley door, every part of that airplane Every nut and bolt of that airplane, every working part is stamped with a serial number that goes into the book for that airplane. And that information has never been made public because most likely those four airplanes were turned into military tankers by Dov Zakheim, that was the comptroller of the Pentagon. Later on, they came out and claimed that they found a black box Uh, But here's the problem. The Pentagon 
black box was made by a company that wasn't even making black boxes at the time the airplane that was supposedly crashed into the Pentagon. The FBI really has been covering up everything about 9-11. There was a person who has contacted me that had business in D.C. at a hotel just across the street from the Pentagon and actually was very familiar with some of the security system around Pentagon. And when I first talked with him, he reassured that there was no 757 crash there. He was standing on the lawn. He did help some people that were injured on the inside when the missile hit. And he called his boss, drove home because he couldn't fly. And several days later, his boss called him and they sent the corporate jet down to pick him up. He needed to come to the headquarters office. And when he got there, there were some what we call men in black waiting for him. And they brought him into a conference room, closed the doors, and it was just the men in black with this one guy. And all they knew was he had been at the Pentagon on 9-11. And so they show him a high-definition, high-quality video of a missile hitting the Pentagon and turned to him and said, Now, is this what you saw? Is this what you saw? And he said, Well, I never said to anybody I saw any aircraft. I saw an explosion. And so his boss misrepresented his story to the government, and they brought the men in black in, and then instead of interviewing him and asking him what he thought he saw or what he had seen that day at hit the Pentagon, they showed him the video of the missile hitting the Pentagon. Now, this guy's involved with cameras and stuff like that. So he recognized the super high quality photograph or video he was looking at. And there was no doubt what it was that he was looking at. But they kind of made a mistake. I don't know how many other people they may have done that to, but it's really, really interesting because there is somebody else that I'm dealt with, and he was in military intelligence, that was at the Pentagon, not inside, but he worked inside, but was at the guard railing, standing right there, and saw an explosion, and there was no aircraft at all. I've had a lot of people that have come forward, and, and every one of them has told me the same thing. They were there, and there was no aircraft there. So when there's no 757 that crashed into the Pentagon, what happened? Another interesting thing happened. After Methodical Illusion came out, my publisher got a phone call from some people, and he and his wife had been somewhere on vacation, and they met a couple. He was a Navy man, and his wife had actually been in the Pentagon the morning of 9-11. He said, when my wife let, let her tell you her story, it was an hour or two, I'm not quite sure exactly, before anything hit in New York, she was at work at her office in the Pentagon, and her phone rang, and a voice she does not know to this day who it was said to her, get the hell out of the Pentagon and get out of there now, and hung up. She grabbed her purse and her belongings and got out of that building, and then the rest of the day unfolded. People knew in advance, and for some reason, whoever made that phone call to her didn't want her to be killed. She doesn't know who that was, but it does tell us that people knew in advance. Some of the doomsday planes were actually near the Pentagon when the explosion hit. So what else is the government lying about? When I found the fact that these E-4Bs were on this radar strip, well, what else are they lying about? One of the things that I noticed about the truth movement, there isn't a single group that isn't completely infiltrated by central intelligence or Mossad or both. Not a single group. It was an intelligence operation that then was covered up by the intelligence operations. So in this case, in 9-11, most of the cover-up was done by the FBI. And it was so different than what they told you through the CIA-controlled Mockingbird media. Well, that's exactly the same point. I mean, what happened with regards to 9-11 and what we, you were told 
was completely different from what really happened. And we've brought that out many times. What you are being told by the Mockingbird media as to what happened and what really did happen is completely different. Some of the other things that the FBI did in 9-11 is they almost instantaneously showed up to the houses of people who received phone calls. You know, you've heard the various phone calls for, that came off cell phones and, you know, whatnot on the airplane, or at least they claim they came off cell phones. You know, they called family members and they called, you know, whoever. But they showed up at these people's houses and c tried to convince them that they didn't hear what they heard. And that's the same thing that they did in Flight 800. They tried to convince the people that saw these missiles go up and hit this airplane and, you know, alter it from the way it actually flew. They tried to convince them that what they saw and what they heard wasn't what they saw and what they heard. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing that you would have a, a government entity whose purpose is to protect and to serve, so to speak, to cover up a crime. This is why I have always said that the FBI is the most corrupt organization in the history of the world. Not because they're inherently corrupt, but because they do whatever they're told. And if they're told yeah. to cover it up, mm -hmm. they cover it up. And it, at the end, you're really angry. It makes you angry that they did this and how they did it and why they did it. The FBI is part of the deep state the CIA, the intelligence operations, Mossad, all of them worked together. They were all behind 9-11. They weren't in it alone, but they had enough of their people in enough of our intelligence and the Pentagon. MI6 was involved. The CIA is working with other government intelligence agencies. I actually got contacted by somebody from GCHQ because I mentioned their involvement, and he reconfirmed what I had uh, mentioned. Awfully surprised that you knew that those particular pilots were British pilots. Remember if the large Russia cargo plane that was going to the Mojave full of gold for weeks prior to 9-11? You know, the vaults that were emptied before the buildings fell down? That gold all went to a CIA site in California. How do I know this? Because the people that were air traffic controllers at the time vectoring that aircraft for a landing at Mojave questioned why British pilots were given approval to fly straight through restricted airspace that only certain U.S. military planes can go through ever. And so it, that got their attention. And several of them knew what was going on and started watching this plane and noticed that it was doing this every Saturday night. A busload of what appeared to be flight attendants with their little black suitcases for an overnight, would get out of a bus at the Boneyard, get on the 757, it would pass restricted airspace around Edwards Air Force Base, go to Las Vegas, and continue on to Dulles Airport. They were some of these people that would be eventually be called on to be passengers and working crew. Now, most of the working crew, by the way, on flight 11, there were nine flight attendants. Seven of them were replaced and put on at the last minute. And it, more than 50% of the crew members on all the flights, more closer to 75% or higher. And that's very unusual that people are replaced at the last minute. What I've done is I've kind of gone through and followed up on them and their families and their association with known Central Intelligence Agency front companies and the like, because there's a reason certain people were put on uh, those planes. It needs to be understood. All of the intelligence agencies work together, and they work together to pull off a stunt like 9-11 and to cover it up. And so they all benefited the oil companies and look to see who the politicians involved in oil. Remember the CIA pilot that killed his kids and his dog and himself? The CIA pilot that worked with Barry Seal running drugs up back in the United States from Central America? Arms, the Iran-Contra, the whole thing? It was the CIA that killed him because he knew too much. He knew the involvement of the Bush family for sure. 
well, they needed to make sure that guy never spoke. Well, you know, I think of all the stories that you've told, my favorite is the fact that you actually met somebody that was in a special ops program that was in Afghanistan right after 9-11, and more than once they had Osama bin Laden in their gun sights and couldn't get permission from the top. And we're not talking about the sergeant in the corner. We're talking about somebody in the White House, which means that they didn't want Osama bin Laden dead. That's because Osama bin Laden was a CIA asset. Are you starting to see the one common thread through all of this talk about 9-11? He was a CIA asset. 